But I believe that by overwhelming majority in all the Americas, you and I in the long run, and if it be necessary, you and I will act together to protect, to defend by every means at our command. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast, where we discuss how leaders and their decisions shape the world we live in today. Welcome to Episode 2, Part 1 of the History in Motion podcast. My name is Richie, and I'm here with our co-host, Paul, and today we're going to be talking about Harry S. Truman and the decision to drop two atomic bombs on Japan in the last stages of World War II. We're going to be discussing Truman's rise to power, how a man with very little education and early success in his life would go on to become the 33rd president of the USA and ultimately lead the U.S. through the last stages of World War II. We will look at the decision to drop the bombs on Japan by looking at both U.S. and Japanese perspectives while trying to understand Japanese domestic politics and the rising threat of Soviet-style communism and how it impacted both Truman's decision-making and the influence it had on Japanese politics. So without further ado, let's get into it. Awesome. So... I think it's going to be important to start with a bit of Truman's highlight reel before we kind of set into a discussion about the trajectory and path of his life uh, until he would ultimately make that fateful decision to drop two atomic bombs on Japan. So he was the 33rd Democratic president of the USA. He served as vice president under Roosevelt in 1953. He assumed the presidency after Roosevelt's death, 80 days into his vice presidency. Uh, Yeah, which is crazy. Um, he's known for kind of leading the Truman Committee, which was around finding and correcting problems uh, specific to U.S. war production and waste uh, around inefficiencies and war profiteering. He was an avid supporter of the Marshall Plan, uh, which was essentially this European recovery program, um, you know, to provide, you know, U.S. aid to Western European countries to support them uh, in their rebuilding after the devastation of World War II. He was the architect of the Truman Doctrine, which is the kind of American foreign policy framework that originated with the primary goal of containing Soviet geopolitical expansion during the Cold War. And he was a staunch advocate for NATO and civil rights. And the reason I wanted to start kind of with his highlights is because, you know, for the first few decades of his life, he doesn't really amount to much. You know, ironically, he's like (laughs) historically quite unassuming and he's been referred to as the accidental president. So, you know, I think we'll come to find, um, at least in my opinion, that although he was a quote unquote late bloomer, you know, he was quite opportunistic, he was very intelligent, and he was able to make the most out of his opportunities that were presented to him, and he would continue to kind of leverage these opportunities to, to, to really progress his career um, in the military as well as politically to ultimately, you know, lead to the to the presidency hereafter. Yeah, and I think even you start to look at some of these things, like when you look back at 20th century history, like what, what are some of the things that people really point to is obviously his work in World War II, which we'll get into, but, you know, the Marshall Plan and NATO, like, we're still feeling that today, especially with NATO and, and the Marshall Plan and, and how that affected Eastern Europe and, and war-torn Europe, so... And how it yeah, still maybe a late impacts boomer, war-torn but, Europe, right? Like, in t- yeah. to date, we're still seeing it. This is, yeah, this isn't a guy, you know, he, yeah, he may have been that late bloomer, but, you know, talk about packing in as much in, you know, impactful <laughs> things into, you know, the back end of your life. So, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. hope for the back end of my life. <laughs> yeah, it's no kidding, right? Like, I think, I think a lot of people, right, it's like, oh, I'm 35, you know, or tw- 30, like, I don't know what to do with the rest of my life. And then, Tru- you know, let's go, go look at Truman's life. And if you can accomplish exactly. 1% of what he did, right, you're, you're doing okay. You're doing okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I think it's kind of unassuming. Like, so if we look at his early life, you know, he's born in Lamar, Missouri, May 18th, 1884. He's the eldest son of John Anderson Truman and his mom, Martha Ellen Young Truman. Here's a random historical fact that may prove very useful if you're ever embroiled in a game of trivia. His middle initial S is not actually an abbreviation of a particular name. It's just a letter, but it honors both of his grandfathers. So, I think that's really, pretty cool, especially that is pretty cool. you know in a in a you know just kind of Western society, right? Like usually the the father's name, the grandfather's name gets passed on, and yeah. you know in this case, right? There's there's some piece to you know his mother's grandfather, which I think is yeah. her mother's father, that's which nice. I think is pretty cool. 
Yeah, as a kid, uh, yeah, he's he's quite an interesting child. So he's uh, he's interested in music, reading, and history. He has a very good relationship with his mom, who kind of encourages all of these hobbies. Um, historians have often commented on how often he actually solicited solicited political and personal advice from his mom throughout his life. He was also an avid piano player. Uh, he rose at 5 a.m. every morning when he was a kid. Uh, he studied more than twice a week up until the point that he was 15, and he became quite a skilled pianist. Uh, in his younger years, he worked as a page at the 1900 Democratic National Conventions in, in Kansas City, um, which, you know, a little bit of foreshadowing, as his father had many friends active in the Democratic Party who helped, who would later help, you know, Harry get his first political position. And we transition, and as we transition to his working career, uh, as he matures into kind of this this pre-adolescent adolescent stage in his life, um, you know, he briefly works in the mailroom of the Kansas City Star um, before obtaining a job as a timekeeper uh, as a part of the Santa Fe Railway Company. He then works as a clerk at the National Bank of Commerce in Kansas City with his brother. Uh, in 1906, he returns to his Grandview family farm where he lives until entering the army in 1917. Uh, while he's at the farm, he meets a young woman named Bess Wallace. He begins to court her. He proposes in 1911. She turns him down. <laughs> Poor guy. Uh, he did intend to propose again, but he wanted to have a better income than that of a farmer when he did propose. And, you know, to his credit, he, he tried. Um you know, mm -hmm. following his time in the war, he was active in several business ventures, uh, lead and zinc mining, real estate speculation in Kansas City. He was able to derive some income, but like none of these ventures actually proved successful in the long term, sadly for him. Um, I also think it's important to note that he was the only president since William McKinley, who was elected in 1896, who did not have a college degree. Wow. That's Makes pretty crazy because you even think about it today, right? Like you're running for office. It's always like, you know, Harvard law graduate or something crazy. Was Obama, like not even wasn't just a it? degree, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. it's, it's the definitely. Like you're the, not even knocking at the door without mm -hmm. that, like some sort of serious educational pedigree. Yeah. You're either a lawyer or some sort of, you know, successful business person, but not yep. just, you know, a person who worked on a farm for, for 15 <laughs> years. And exactly. Yeah. That's quite interesting. And I think to his credit, it never really held him back. And I think to him, what we'll see next is like when we start talking about his military service, this is where things really start to evolve and get interesting for him because we get to see some of those tangibles of his character come out that would, you know, define his later years and like I guess his legacy as 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 the VP and the president moving forward. So he joins the National Guard um, because he's de declined from West Point for poor eyesight. Uh, and he gets his first major opportunity when World War One breaks out. Uh, so when the U.S. enters the war in 1917, Truman um, is rejoining Battery B. So this is this new expansion unit for the military. He helps recruit soldiers, um, and he's elected as the first lieutenant. Uh, before he's deployed to France, he's sent for training uh, at three different sites across the U.S. until his regiment is federalized as the 129th field artillery so um, in mid 1918 one million soldiers of the expeditionary forces land in france truman is promoted as captain april 23rd of the newly arrived battery d 129th field artillery 35th division so battery d for short is known for having its discipline problems and truman was initially sent there to kind of clean it up he was initially very unpopular because, you know, obviously he was there to kind of take the chaos and create some order. Um, despite attempts of the men to intimidate him, he was ultimately successful because he would make his corporals and sergeants accountable. He would back them up if they performed capably, but if they did not, he was not afraid to demote them to private. So Truman's unit joined a massive prearranged assault on September 26, 1918, at the opening of the Meuse Argonne Offensive. Uh, this is where Truman would kind of make a name for himself when he ignored orders to limit fighting to targets that were only facing the 35th Division. Rather than kind of hold back and listen to the orders, he patiently waited until the Germans had walked their horses away from their guns, ensuring that they could not relocate out of the range of Truman's battery. He then ordered his men to open fire, and there they attacked the enemy battery, and his actions were actually credited with saving the lives of the 28th Division soldiers who otherwise would have come under German fire. 
because of this, Truman was off. Like he was given a lashing by his commander, Colonel Carl D. Clem, who essentially had kind of threatened to convene a court martial against him for disobeying direct orders. But he never actually followed through, and Truman was never punished. Um, I think a lot of historians, based on what I read, really see this military experience as a massive turning point for Truman. Um, where he was able to manifest some leadership qualities. He had entered the service in 1917 um, as a family farmer who worked clerical jobs that didn't require him to motivate or lead anyone. But during the war, he did the exact opposite. He gained leadership experience and had a number of successes that greatly enhanced and supported his post-war political career. You know, he was awarded the World War I Victory Medal, two battle clasps, a defensive secretary clasp, and he was also the recipient of two armed forces reserved medals. Like you got to ask yourself, you know, like <laughs> how did this guy just rise to the occasion in the first major global conflict? This whole kind of like forged and fire metaphor kind of comes to mind when I'm kind of reading this particular aspect of his life. Yeah, it's this like. Hey, you're right, like almost forged in fire, but almost thrown into the fire. And yeah, just yeah, kind yeah. of seeing what happened, right? And it's interesting, right? Because you kind of look back at at everything he did. It's very like entrepreneurial, very individualistic of like kind of running a farm off by himself, you know, running a little shop, like all these sort of things. And you know, yeah, nothing, you know, clerical work, very lonely kind of work, pushing papers and and stamping things. I'm sure, and it, and it's just there. There must have been something, and you got to wonder where it comes from. Like I, I can see. Like definitely the discipline was there from a young age, like, you know, playing the piano and, and that kind of stuff, like getting up early every day, like that military lifestyle probably calls for something like that. But you're right. Like, where does that leadership come from? And like, maybe it was just sitting in there and and it just needed a needed a spot to come out. And, and maybe that's all it is. But I feel like there's more to yeah. more to Truman than maybe meets the eye when you when you really break down like who he was as a kid. And that would be really interesting to see if we ever had that opportunity to look into it. Well, I think it's an interesting sentiment, right? Like this idea that our leaders born or our leaders made, mm. you know, like that's always that kind of like that, that kind of juxtaposition between when we talk about leadership. And I don't know, I don't know in this case, maybe he always had it or maybe he just kind of had to develop it as a necessity out of mm -hmm. the position that he was in. Either way, you know, like it's quite impressive. Right. And there's some level of... I think you could almost make the argument that this is he was a born leader, but didn't maybe didn't have the confidence to know that he had it or was never or the, given opportunity the opportunity to exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. Like yeah. you could look at like those leaders who are made, right? It's usually you kind of see that slow growth or you see like they're been groomed from a young age or yes. whatever it might yep. be. It was just like he joined the army and was kind of pretty good at what he did and yeah. <laughs> it's kind of seemed to happen. So yeah, it, it does make you wonder. And it's and it's the other kind of question too of like you know, do great leaders like choose to lead? Like, do they say, I'm going to be a leader or do they just kind of be told, hey, you're the best at this, so you need to lead? And I kind of see it of a bit more of the latter here, like join the military. It's like, hey, you seem to know what you're doing. Go do this. Oh, you've done pretty well. Keep doing this. Keep doing it other things. It naturally kind of took advantage of those things that were you yeah. know, characteristic and innate to him. It gave him that kind of environment to really, you know, flesh those things out and, and work mm -hmm. within that kind of, uh, within that culture. For sure. Yeah, it's this, it, here's what's given to you. There's some luck involved, I'm sure, but you can only take what's been given to you. Exactly. Well, and I think this is, again, this is that kind of pattern with him that we'll see like after. So after the war, he returns back, he goes back to Independence, Missouri. He gets married. He has a child. He starts a haberdashery. That's a men's clothing store for anyone who has is not familiar with that word. Um, this sadly goes under during the recession of 1921, and he finds himself in debt and struggling to find work. And here is a very interesting and controversial turning point in the Truman story that involves like the nefarious character Tom Pendergast and his quote unquote political machine. So at the highest level, Tom Pendergast is this like American political boss who controlled Kansas City and Jackson County, Missouri from 1925 to 1939. So essentially, if you had any kind of like p political affiliation at this point or role, you were either likely doing the bidding of and or supporting the Pendergast political machine. So Truman is essentially tapped on the shoulder and is elected to county court judge of Jackson County, Eastern District in 1922. 
he was contacted by Mike Pendergast, the younger brother of Tom Pendergast, to run for the election. And uh, few historians doubt that it was Mike's son, Jim Pendergast, who had served with Harry Truman and had recommended him based on his leadership qualities that he had seen during his time in the military. Um, and it's interesting to note that this Pendergast machine, as, as it's referred to, you know, although quite nefarious, was successful because it relied on people like Truman, uh, people from hardworking, working class backgrounds who were essentially really good at their jobs and were able to deliver results. And I guess it comes back to that, like, again, in the right place at the right time for him. Like, not only was he given this leadership Dude. and thrived, it just happened to be that someone in the background was watching and it was not only someone with power, but someone like who was from the same hometown as you. Yeah. Or the, it's well, and they knew his dad like, too, right? So they, there must right. have been something there because his dad was involved in the Democratic mm. National Convention for a long time. So, like, I couldn't mm -hmm. find it in my research, but like, I, I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to assume that there's some there's right. some networking, there's some patronage going on here, you know, across across families. Okay. Well, yeah, and I wonder I, too, like when you sign up for the military, right? Like you have. I wonder if they kind of bring some people from different areas together, but you definitely kind of see like when you look back, it's like, oh, this you know person from Texas, person from Virginia, but yeah. Yeah, maybe it was just the luck of the draw. But again, worked out well for Truman as as well, things I think go, this this is the thing, now, dude. Right? It, it keeps happening and it keeps and it continues to happen, which is the best part. So okay, in 1926, he runs for presiding judge. He wins again with the support of the Pendergast machine. He's reelected in 1930. And you know, not only is he reelected, like he's quite good at what he accomplishes as his uh, in this role as the presiding judge. So he helps coordinate the 10 year plan, which essentially transformed Jackson County and the Kansas City skyline with new public work projects. This included an extensive series of roads and construction of end of a newly designed county court building. Um, in 1933, um, Truman was named Missouri's director for the federal reemployment program at the request of the postmaster general. And after serving as a county judge, he wanted to run for governor or Congress, but Pendergast initially rejected this. Um, but after his first four choices declined, he had to go back to Truman and was then backed by Pendergast in the 1934 Democratic primary election for the U U.S. Senate uh, from Missouri. And in, the tw and in the general election, he defeated incumbent uh, Roscoe C. Patterson by nearly 20 points in a continuing wave of what's known as like the pro-New Deal Democrats that were elected following the Great Depression. And Truman assumed office with his reputation as the, as the senator from Pendergast. But he was able to, in some part, defend the machine that got him elected by being very vocal and voting in alignment with his conscience. He was also very vocal and spoke out against corporate greed, the dangers of Wall Street speculators, and other moneyed special interests that were attaining too much influence in national affairs. Uh, in 1940, Truman would travel to various military bases to, to critically look at the waste and profiteering he had saw that had led to the chairmanship of the Committee on Military Affairs to start investigations into the abuses while the nation prepared for war. Um, a new special committee was set up under Truman to conduct a formal uh, investigation. The Roosevelt administration at the time was supportive of this plan, uh, rather than have to deal with a more hostile probe by what would have been the House of Representatives. This was followed by the Truman Committee, which is seen as one of his greatest achievements, that reportedly saved $15 billion. That's equivalent to $220 billion USD in 2021, and its activities put Truman on the cover of Time magazine. The effectiveness of this committee essentially allowed Truman to rebrand and distance himself as the, um, you know, Kansas City errand boy to an effective political and skillful leader. Again, it's this given the given the opportunity, and I think like there's just some level of leadership, and I think organization as well. He can just when he he comes in and he finds like, hey, what does he know well? The military, he can do something with that, and and again shows this leadership to kind of come in and, and do what he needs to do. And it, he may kind of starts to see like being a bit more of a savvy politician here too, right? Like understanding that, you know, Roosevelt doesn't want the house of representatives poking around because, you know, partisanship will take over and people start pointing fingers where, you know, the, the country is about to be at war. You know, there's, there's no time to be screwing around and, and pointing fingers. Like someone needs to get down to, to business. And that seems like what he is, like he's a, a no nonsense kind of guy, get in, get the job done, but sticking to his morals, I think is, 
is something that we've seen and I think we'll continue to see as he moves on with his life. And he's, he's a good worker, you know? Like, this is what yeah. I'm kind of gleaning from, like, reading about him. And, like, this, whatever the job was, like, you know, Harry could get it done. <laughs> whatever, yeah. he was just like, okay, well, this is what I got to do. Let's let's rationally and pragmatically think through a plan to accomplish goals X, Y, and Z. Because mm -hmm. it seems like that's what he did. You know, he had goals in mind wherever he kind of ended up. And, you know, whatever the objective was, he would just he would he would solve it he would find a resolution some way or another and again yeah. uh, you know i think we'll see this more as we kind of uh, progress this conversation but if we kind of turn to his vice presidency uh, again very similar situation right man at the right time <laughs> um so most of roosevelt's advisors during the 1944 election weren't too um optimistic on his chances of actually being able to live out his fourth term so the role of VP became exceedingly important um, because they would often, you know, they're going to overtake uh, for Roosevelt once he does pass. So Henry Wallace, who had served as VP for four years, was seen as far too left and friendly with labor. Roosevelt ultimately would have to choose between Truman or Supreme Court just, Justice William O. Douglas for the 1944 election. Um, State, city, and party leaders preferred Truman, who would eventually get the nod, and the Roosevelt-Truman ticket achieved a 432-99 to victory, defeating the Republican ticket. His vice presidency was relatively uneventful up until the moment Roosevelt died on April 12th, 1944. Uh, Truman had been vice president for 82 days. The day Roosevelt passed away, he received an urgent message to go immediately to the White House, where Eleanor Roosevelt told him that her husband had died after a massive cerebral hemorrhage. Truman asked if there was anything he could do for her. She replied, is there anything we can do for you? For you are the one in trouble now. He was <laughs> sworn in as president at 7.09 p.m. April 12, 1944, in the West Wing of the White House. On his first full day, Truman told reporters, boys, if you ever pray, pray for me now. I don't know if you fellows ever had a load of hay fall on you, but when they told me what happened yesterday, I felt like the moon, the stars, and all the planets had fallen on me. Wow. I, it just, I, can't, I keep going back to, you know, do leaders, do great leaders, do they choose to lead or, or are they chosen? And I, I think you can say here, in going from not even being really and seriously in politics to being the president of the United States in 10 years by like, come on. But, yeah. Come and like, on. And what it, a meteoric I, rise. Like, right. There's and, no other way to, like, there's no other way to characterize it. It's, it's so, it's so crazy. Mm -hmm. And I think too, like you can see people sitting in the background, probably watching what he's doing saying like, yeah, this guy's got something, maybe not to be president quite yet, but definitely to, you know, be the vice president. And so it's it's just so interesting to see like how he can rise to this level, and then even to the point where like I've read that like he didn't even really want the VP nomination. It kind of just happened because he was kind of left over, you know, being fourth choice for senator, kind of being in the mix for VP, and then bang, there he is, president of the United States. It's it's absolutely insane when you really look at that timeline. Yeah, it's uncanny. It's 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 hard to kind of fathom, right? Like how effective he was able to do it, and it's. I don't like. I don't want to detract from what he did, but at the same time, I have to ask myself: like, did he ever plan on being president? You know what I mean? Like, was this mm. ever actually on the docket for him, or did he just keep working so hard and being so successful that people were like, "This guy could make a great VP," <laughs> and he just kind of right. found himself in this position again? <laughs> he was probably like, like, I could see him being, like, "Yeah, let's see how this VP thing works out." You know, maybe. Maybe I'm looking at Roosevelt being, yeah, I could do that job one day, like, but you know, we'll see where things go. You know, not definitely not 80 days later. I definitely yeah. don't think he had that planned. So yeah, it's it's unbelievable. It really is when you when you see that rise and you know, well, there he is. He's he's in the driver's seat, and as we'll tend to see, right? He he may have not wanted things, but boy, did he do you know sit down and and be disciplined and and do a good job and work hard wherever he went. And I think we can see he is a man that's been driven by duty, right? Like. He knows that he has a service to give to his country in the military, a service in politics. Um, and so he has people are depending on him. So he's going to step it up to another level. And so I think now that can kind of bring us into, you know, 
him as president and, and really the ultimate decision um, we get to with dropping the atomic bomb. And I, and I think before we can really get into, you know, that decision, we have to look at, you know, where, where the war has come to um, up to this point. Um, so really like there's a decision to drop the bomb in Japan, but there's about two or three good years of history here that, that really shine some light on why that decision was made. So if we kind of roll or what, Roll back to December 7th, 1941. That's when the United States um, is bombed by Japan at, at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, which kickstarts the, another part of the Pacific theater um, in World War II, which that, that, that theater had been going on for five, six, seven years, depending on how you want to start with wars in China and, and um, different parts of um, the Pacific and, and South Asia and Southeast Asia. After the very next day, um, the, the U.S. colony um, in the Philippines is invaded. And this is where we see something different. So the Japanese are much more brutal than anything the Americans have ever seen in any war they fought. You know, there was some level, I guess, of humility, you could call it, when they were fighting the Germans. But when we look at how things went down with Japan, um, it really all starts in the Philippines. So after the, the Philippines is taken by the Japanese, it takes about six months to do so. There's about 5,000 to 18,000 Filipino and U.S. POWs that died during what was called the Bataan Death March. Basically, the Japanese forced these POWs to march almost 100 kilometers um, in the hot April sun uh, of the Philippines. And they would do cr- like absolutely cruel things. Like They would do something called sun treatment, um, in quotes, um, which was a form of torture where they would just leave prisoners out in the sun with no, no water, nothing. Um, and if they, you know, they would complain or ask for water, they, they would be shot dead. Um, there were some men who were told to strip naked and stand in front of like cool, fresh water. You know, these men have not had water in days. And if they fell over, they were killed. And it was like this, not only was it cruel, but it was on a physical level, but psychologically too, right? Like don't trip because if you trip, that could be the last step you ever take. So there's this level of brutality of not like we've defeated you, but we're going to make you suffer. And we are going to put this level of, terror into everybody that's you know involved with you so that's kind of the first thing on like the level of brutality and then and then you got the japanese suicide tactics so we kind of you know kamikaze pilots are the classic example people go to of you know flying planes directly into american ships killing the pilot but doing you know a crazy amount of damage but the other thing too is the japanese did not like to surrender it was considered dishonorable to do so so you would see these mass suicides during a lot of battles where instead of you know, surrendering to um, the Americans, they would just have these mass suicides, grenades, gunshots, anything, stab themselves. And there's some crazy examples. So there was a, a ba- the Battle of Iwo Jima um, that was this major strategic volcanic island that was within range of Japan for U.S. Um, fighters to escort their bombers. So big opportunity for the U.S. to actually bomb the Japanese mainland. Of the 20,000 Japanese soldiers um, that were stationed on that island, on- only 216 were taken prisoner. The rest were killed or missing in action, and a, f- a few thousand went into hiding. Uh, that came out years later. But like, that's like a 99% level of casualties. And then we see it again in Okinawa, where almost 94% of the Japanese defenders were killed. Like, even if you go to Wikipedia and you look at the numbers, it's like the number of confirmed dead is like higher than the um, number of like the the size of the army that was expected. So like, there's a little bit of play, like a few thousand here, a few thousand there. But again, it's you're getting up to almost. 100% of these soldiers being killed um, in action. So there's, this, there's these two things like this is not something you would ever seen in modern war. And it really kind of goes down to we're going to have to fight this war differently than we have, you know, in World War One or anything on the Western Front in Europe. Well, it's interesting too, right? This whole idea of like shame around losing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very unique, I think, to Japanese culture that goes back, you know, to time and memoriam in terms of like being a disgraced warrior, a disgraced soldier and sacrificing oneself to kind of, uh, to reconcile or have some sort of restitution for that shame. Like this isn't something that's, it's, it's taking a new form, you know, in the modern sense, but it is a, a, a cultural kind of relic that's been there for a very long time. And it's interesting to see the kind of form it took in this theater of war. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's something that's been throughout history too. Like you would see in, in ancient times, like you know, it's like someone knew that they were going to be assassinated, but the the emperor would give them the opportunity to have to a noble themselves. suicide death, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah, and yeah, so there's yeah. a level of nobility and 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 honor to it. But um, yeah, it's 
but to be seen on a mass scale like this, I don't think is something that anybody was really prepared for. Yep. So we kind of we kind of move on here. It's like you can see, okay, the stage is set that like the Japanese are not going to give up without a fight and potentially, you know, more of a fight than anybody really have anticipated. But if we kind of go back before we get into the bombing itself, um, before Okinawa, this and this is something that kind of blew my mind as I looked into it. Um, the U.S. had created a new type of firebomb, which we know as napalm. And so napalm is this kind of gelatin substance almost that um, that's made from petroleum. And basically when it hits, it sticks to things, but it's on fire when it does so. So think of it like sticking to walls, vehicles, and just burning for hours and hours, but it also sticks to skin as well. So it is a very cruel way to, you know, people being burned alive, um, can't get this stuff off. It sticks to everything. And it's incredibly terrifying for you know anybody to see so on one night in march 1945 there was 279 b-29s dropped 1600 tons of bombs onto tokyo and, and the devastation here is is almost unspeakable an estimated 100,000 to 150,000 people were killed in one night and this breaks the record for the most in any single night of bombing so this breaks the record for what happened in hiroshima and nagasaki with the atomic bomb this breaks the record for what happened in dresden and hamburg and some of the bombing campaigns and not only just beats them like dwarfs them like you know i think dresden was a 20 30,000 people something like that like we're up to over 100,000 people plus a million left homeless but it did have a, a pretty profound effect on the war effort some estimates are that tokyo's manufacturing output was cut in half so i think this is like this precedent now that's been set that you know bombing carpet bombing cities and destroying the civilian population is something that has been happening this entire war so moving towards an atomic bomb i I don't think is that much of a lift other than you know the technology that was used to provide this devastation yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, one of the things that I always find striking about this particular war and this point in history is just like the lack of care and just devaluation of the human life. Like just the total amount of destruction that we're seeing in these theaters of war and how many casualties there are. It's just, it's, it, it's shocking. Like it never ceases to shock me when I see numbers like this. You know, mm-hmm. a hundred to a hundred fifty thousand people were killed in one night. Yeah. Like that's in a crazy. night too. Like in it's a, a matter night. of hours, right? Like yeah. And killed in one of the most brutal ways possible, right? About. Yeah. Like yeah. it's just like it, just the lack of care for humanity at this point because of what is going on in the world is just mm-hmm. it never ceases to just like leave me in awe and just kind of speechless at, at times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I guess, the mix of new technology and not fully understanding what it can do, but then also going, oh my God, this is what it can do. Well, it's depersonalized war in a way, right? Like It's a great point, yeah. You drop a bomb not, out of a plane, right? We're not going we bayonet to bayonet anymore. Yeah. Like, I'm not I'm not stuffing, you know, like pellets into a rifle, and then if that's screwed, I'm going to go tackle you <laughs> and then kill you with my bayonet. Like, this is not what we're seeing, our cannonball fodder. This is, this is total destructive war. Yeah. Um, where you know, and you can see that depersonalization happen in other respects. Um, the I, I know I think you had mentioned it offline, but the propaganda that we're seeing, it's really mm-hmm. aimed around kind of dehumanizing um, people that we're at war against. You know, whether it's portraying them as like vermin or rats, which mm-hmm. was quite um, popular. You know, with the Germans doing it to the Jews, or you know, us doing it to the Japanese. You know, like. Um, it was quite common. So I think, you know, it, it kind of ties in together really with that sentiment. That's a great point, right? Like, yeah. If you ever see like that American propaganda towards the Japanese, it was, it was not like, Hey, here's what an actual Japanese person looks like. It is yeah, a caricature of something quite hideous and sinister. Yep. Um, so yeah, let's, you know, it makes it maybe a little bit easier to, easier to, kill. to drop yep. 1600 tons of bombs on them in one night. So, you know, after that happens and, and then the U S takes Okinawa, which, which is basically the first kind of, part of japan proper if you will um there's these islands south of the japanese mainland uh, but the the cost was huge for both sides um so they're getting to the point now where okay what do we do next there's a potential invasion of the of the japan mainland but now the atomic bomb is ready so originally it was designed to drop on berlin but um at this point um the 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 germans had already surrendered so you know japan you're you're still in this fight um and, and that's where it's going to go. So 
on July 26, 1945, um, the Allies created something called the Potsdam Declaration, and it was issued to the Japanese, basically asking for unconditional surrender, with the alternative being, quote, prompt and utter destruction. Wow. So it's just wow. <laughs> yeah. Just wow. On prompt and utter destruction. Not only wow. is it going to is destruction coming, it's coming promptly. Like, <laughs> get ready, right? But there's something interesting in this unconditional surrender. Um, it wasn't like they they made it very clear the Americans and and the British was and a few other the Allied forces was, you know, Japan must surrender everything. The emperor must step down. We are going to take over this country, but we're not going to enslave you. We are not going to destroy your culture. In fact, we want to get you back on your feet. And we want you to have normal lives and we want you to run an economy and run your businesses. But there was no way you'll ever wage war again. That was kind of the whole point of it. And I think that it really goes, it was really well worded, I think, because you really take away that like piece of, oh my God, well, if we surrender, are they going to come in and, and kill us? Are they going to destroy our culture? And I'm sure that propaganda was going around at the time, right? Because you know, as, as people, right, you see the, the big bad Americans coming and we saw the Japanese propaganda um and i'm sure the american propaganda was just the same way right um towards the japanese people so that's kind of you know where they were at and you know that um the the japanese had to respond to that so this is where i think things get a little bit interesting and so if we look at where the japanese decision comes into play here on on that declaration we have to kind of go back a little bit to kind of understand what was kind of going on internally with their politics and so we were really fortunate being at the time we are in history right now. Um, there was a lot of stuff released kind of after the fall of the Soviet Union um, in the 90s from the Japanese, Americans, and the, and the Russians um, that kind of highlighted a lot of the interworkings that were going on within the Japanese hierarchy. Um, there was a lot of intercepted messages that were decoded and all these sort of things. We have a really good idea of what was actually going on um, inside Japan at the time. So the kind of the team that was making the decision was called the Supreme Council for the Direction of the War, um, which was made up of six ministers who reported directly to the emperor and were appointed by him. But there was this like weird nuance where the military officials had to get permission from their ar- end of the branch of the of the army to actually move into like a political life. So there was definitely some say on how who would get into political office by the army. But at the end of the day, this is an absolute monarchy. Whatever the emperor says goes. Um, but this council definitely did have the emperor's ear and, and were in charge of making a lot of decisions. So they were their prime minister at the time, who was kind of the, the leader of this council, was um, a man by la- with the last name Suzuki. Um, and he was a former admiral in the Navy. Um, and so in this council, we had s- we had the six people and there was they were kind of split into two camps. They, they realized um, at some point in 1945 that they knew they needed to that this war was going to go badly and they weren't going to win and they needed to have some sort of peace. But there was two kind of schools of thought. There was, okay, we can get a diplomatic peace and we'll use Stalin and the USSR and the Soviet Union as a mediator. Um, Because at the time, Russia had never declared war on Japan. They were just fighting Germany. Um, There was a history where they had fought in the early 20th century. And it just seemed like another can of worms that Russia wasn't interested in opening. And neither was Japan. Like, there was really no strategic value for them at the time. And, you know, they had bigger things to worry about. And then there's another school of thought where they were like, what if we have one last decisive battle, like a battle with massive casualties to the allies so we can prevent present surrender terms that are much more favorable to us. And so they, you, these are two themes that we'll, you'll continue to see as we move along with these you know, Japanese politics here. Um, but basically, like it got to the point too where the council was meeting in secret. So the six of them plus the emperor, no aides, nothing, because they were so worried, of, worried about being assassinated by fanatical officers within the, the Japanese military. So generals and stuff were like, we're not surrendering ever. And you can see that based on what was happening on the battlefield. So to kind of quash this a little bit, they created a, a public doctrine that said J- Japan would rather face extinction than surrender. So basically this was ex- totally externally facing. Inside, they knew that this wasn't the case, but they definitely needed to get the people on board. They had to tell the Americans, like, look, we're not giving up. So you know, you better give us better surrender terms. And these, I guess, you know, fanatical generals that, you know, we're not giving up, so don't even worry about what we're thinking because this is our official stance. So internally, things are definitely different, but they they start to realize that you know defeat is is imminent. Um, when though is is a matter of debate. And so on June 9th, um, there was an aide to the emperor with the last name Kido, and he wrote something to the emperor and did basically a, a lay of the land and said by the end of 1945 they did, would not have the terms to 
to wage or say the means to wage modern war and contain the civil unrest. So food is getting more scarce. People are getting a little bit more antsy. Um, and then war is expensive. And as the U S is starting to bomb Japan more, that war machine is being ground down. Um, and so he comes to the emperor and says, let's maybe instead of doing pure surrender, unconditional surrender, why don't we present these terms where we'll let, we'll say we're going to disarm, but without allied supervision, like we'll do it ourselves. And then they also said, we're going to leave all of our occupied lands under the condition that they become free nations. So if we think at the time, like Southeast Asia was French Indochina. And so they would basically saying like, look, we've kicked the French out for you. And we've now you can be seen as liberators. So there was kind of like some saving face that the Japanese were trying to do. Um, most of the council was genuinely in favor, but nothing really too concrete happened from this. Um, but then on June 22nd, which was the last day of the Battle of Okinawa, which the Japanese lost, the emperor spoke to the council about ending the war and basically said, I want concrete plans to end the war. I need, we need to study all of them. We need to make efforts that make them happen. And again, they go, let's use the Soviets. And so Richie, we've kind of talked about this a little bit. Let's, let's use the Soviets for really anything is, is never, never it's, yeah, it just never doesn't works. work. And, and it's, it works for a, the Soviets. It yes. works for the Soviets. <laughs> it doesn't work for the party who thinks the Soviets are going to help, but it always yeah. helps the Soviets. <laughs> they're never someone who I'd be like, oh, thank God the Soviets are here. They're going <laughs> to, they're going to make this all work well and they're not going to take everything for themselves. So if we, if we look at using the Soviets as a mediator, um, Japan was holding on to the fact that um, the Soviet Union would remain neutral. But little did they know, Stalin had agreed to join the war uh, when Germany was defeated. So he basically told Roosevelt, give me three months after Germany is defeated and I'll deploy my troops um, into the east and we'll attack um, Japan. So there was conversations actually happening with the Soviets kind of through back channels um, and through some ambass and the ambassadors were talking as well. It didn't really go anywhere. The, the Russians were saying like, hey, like you need to give us more info or like you can't just say hey we don't want to do unconditional surrender but they kept saying like we're not going to do unconditional surrender but help us create some terms and the russians just kind of yeah all right we'll we'll think about what you want and maybe we'll talk through it really the russians are playing them this whole time um they wanted control of the pacific they had already agreed that they would get some land that they had lost in the war um in the early 20th century they were going to get that back access to some more ports and, and interest in china as well so they knew what they wanted they knew what they were getting um, but it definitely didn't involve, um, you know, helping the Japanese out in any way. This was, we're going to, we're going to wait this out and, and we're going to take, you know, what, what we were, what we agreed to, um, with Roosevelt. So, um, that's kind of moving along the, the Japanese are continuously talking to the Soviets, trying to figure out like, okay, how can we use the Soviets? And then that Potsdam declaration comes in and, and on July 26, 1945. Um, and so. Suzuki, the prime minister of Japan at the time, says the government does not put any importance um, to what to this Potsdam Declaration. That's kind of his public um, way of saying it. He's basically said, we will press on to the better end uh, to bring about the successful completion of the war. And so some historians have really taken interest in this statement because he uses a specific Japanese word that can either mean ignore something completely, but still give it value, like not speak about it, or just like ignore it and say that's stupid i'm not gonna worry about that and so some people think like he strategically chose this word so the americans would realize okay they're actually considering this and maybe we should give them some time to figure this out and then people in the army and people in the public were like oh good he's throwing that away we're never going to surrender so he kind of kind of plays this a little bit cleverly if he indeed did there is some debate whether that there, was there just was the way he did. there yeah yeah i like to think there was i think it, he seemed like a smart guy and, and and i think with the way things were going at the time like someone was going to get mad and, and, you know, lives were on, on the line. So that was kind of what he said, but the Americans really understood the situation. So they had had Japan's code cracked from, I think the beginning of the war. And basically they, in a debrief to Truman, they said, quote, until the Japanese leaders realize that an invasion cannot be repelled, there's little likelihood that they, they, they will accept any peace term satisfactory to the allies. So we're at the point here where they're not going to give up with the terms we want. Um, so we got to think, you know, what are those next steps? And, and that's where the atomic bombs come into play. So on August 6th, they dropped the uranium bomb on Hiroshima. Um, 16 hours later, Truman asked for surrender again. They're still waiting. They don't hear anything from the, from the Japanese. And then on August 9th, something even crazier maybe to the Japanese happens is the Soviets invade. And now that blows up everything they'd possibly thought of. What are we going to do now? We can't use Stalin for a mediator. 
We've already been atomic bombed once. What's the worst that could happen? Well, how about hours later, another bomb, right? You now we have Nagasaki that's been hit. So it's kind of a double whammy for the Japanese. They're in disarray. They don't know what to do. Um, you know, the Soviets are, have won the battle in the north and taken the northeast part of China and, and most of Korea. So we go back to the council. It's after, after Nagasaki. So you have, you can't use the Soviets anymore. You don't know the extent of the American nuclear program. So what is going to happen next? They are still split. They still don't know what to do. They're like, three of them were like, yeah, okay, we need to, we'll surrender, but the emperor still has to stay in charge. And the other three are like, well, what if maybe there's one last battle? Maybe if they invade, we can beat them one last time. It's so interesting though, right? Like that is, even then, we're talking two of the most destructive bombs ever dropped in the history of the earth. Nothing before or after. Never to have happened again. Russia has doubled back on you and attacked. And almost to their credit in a weird way, they're still like, yo, maybe <laughs> <laughs> maybe we have a chance. <laughs> yeah. It's, like, fuck. Oh, it's you just can crazy, tell how man. deep that, crazy. that loyalty and that like refusing to surrender is just so deep within the culture. So deep. It's so that from like the low from the private on, on the front lines all the way up to the, the heights of the government. But it gets to the point where basically they agree, okay, we need to surrender. Um, there was a, an American pilot who was captured who basically told the, the Japanese intelligence that the Americans have 100 atomic bombs loaded on planes and Japan will be wiped off the face of the earth in a matter of weeks if you don't surrender. Little did they know there was no, they didn't, Americans didn't have any atomic bombs ready. They had another one coming in a few weeks and then they were probably going to have a fourth one closer to like the end of September. So that definitely wasn't the case, but the Japanese, for all they knew, this is a new technology. All you need is one bomb to destroy a city. Like, what could possibly be next? So they respond to the allies and they say, okay, we'll, we'll surrender, we'll agree to everything, but the emperor must be an absolute monarch. And the allies respond quite cleverly saying, we disagree with that and we're not going to accept those surrender terms. The Japanese people will decide who, who, runs, who rules them. And I think that's pretty cool of like, you know, we're putting democracy in place here, whether you like it or not. Um, so it goes back to the council and the council's like, well, we can't get rid of the emperor. You know, the emperor's been in charge for generations. What are we going to do? Like, w- he's a god in the eyes of the Japanese people. We cannot have him step down. Um, I don't but the emperor to a lot of people, right? Like, I don't think uh, your average person would would know that fact toward, mm-hmm. of history, that especially in the Asian and, and Japanese context, that mm-hmm. the emperor is literally, you know, god. Like, he is seen as a god he is not human like he is god on earth like he, it is his kingdom that he's kind of reigning over it's very unique to how we kind of see our leaders right like they are very human <laughs> they, very. Are, they are they are quite fallible yeah <laughs> and it's interesting because you don't even at that time like there's you know emperors from the past and kings that were deified but to come into the 20th century with a deified god you know yeah. deified leader like it's it's not something you see, but yeah, like he was literally a, a god in their eyes, and and almost you know would stand farther away from people and kind of revered from you know, people would look at him and be oh my god I saw the emperor like this is yep. like touching the hand of God right, but to his credit the emperor he takes a kind of look around and he and he realizes that not only will we lose this war but Japan may cease to exist our culture may be destroyed everything that he loves about his country will be gone and he makes the decision tells the council. Look, I'll step down. Um, I'll be there in a ceremonial role, which kind of happens throughout the next few years. But I, I will agree to not be an absolute monarch anymore, and we will transition into, you know, some form of democracy. And so, to his credit, you know, he was the guy who kind of took control of this council. Um, and thankfully, I guess in this sense, having an absolute monarchy saved a lot of lives, caused a lot of deaths earlier on, obviously up to that point. But to this point, like just having the emperor come in and say, you know what, no, this is done, and they have to agree this this is their god this is their their emperor speaking and so but what happened is right before this happened some senior military leaders caught wind of what was going on and there was actually an attempted coup that happened the night before the emperor was ready to speak to the people about this so senior military leaders actually entered the palace and they were actually looking for prime minister suzuki because they believed that he was kind of pulling the strings and, and convincing the emperor to do this So they actually went into his office. Thank God he wasn't there. They shot the place up, lit it on fire. And he'd left a mere minutes before because he was tipped off by somebody, which was absolutely crazy because like, you know, 
this is the the prime minister of your country in war and you're having a full on coup like with military leaders who will not surrender no matter what would let japan burn to the ground before before they surrender it's absolutely insane like it's crazy the just how the level of commitment to see this all the way through and to not surrender among some of the highest ranking military officials in japan at the time like it is i can't even begin to like wrap my head around it it's it's a different type of world and i and i think like you have some level-headed people who are thinking about it but like this we do not surrender mentality this is the way this is the samurai way yeah. we will not we will not surrender but what the crazier thing to me is the the revolt was put down and when i say put down like there was some violence but mostly the, the leaders walked free after they were like all right guys like we get it you tried you failed <laughs> And so actually the next day they were walking the streets, handing out like leaflets to people defending their actions saying like, this is why we did it. But no way. By the time, that's wild. Yeah. But by this time, <laughs> the emperor had already spoken basically saying like, look, this is done. We're surrendering. Talk to the yeah, people, yeah, yeah. talk to the army, Game basically over. saying like Japan will be destroyed if we don't stop. And so again, when, when your deified leader speaks, the people listen. And I think for a lot of people too, they, you know, the, the public unrest was starting to rise and, you know, there's probably some people who are a little bit more relieved than, than maybe some of the, uh, some of the rest, but you know, that, that's where we get to. And I, I think Richie, this is where we can, you know, pivot for a few minutes before we end on, you know, the decision itself um, from Truman here. Like y- we, we see this, this decision to say, is Japan defeated? And I think we'll, we can get into it in, in part two, a little bit more on, on, you know, the speed of how Japan was, was defeated and what other risks were involved with that. But I think if we look at, the argument that was Japan defeated already? I think the answer was yes, um, but it probably wouldn't have happened as quick as you know we you know many would have liked. Well, it's, but a, I it's, think driving... it's a calculation, right? Like you, mm-hmm. I think according to what we know now, what you've been you know what your research has kind of shown, what I've been told you know throughout studying history in my undergrad, um, Japan was going to fall at one point or another. There was no way they had the total might of the american military pretty much looking at it after germany fell so there was there was no way that the, that kind of they were going to be able to outlast the the machinery of the us um but at what cost right like how if you know as the american government and military that you have the option of fighting a total war and risking massive casualties or you drop this new fancy weapon that could essentially stop the war immediately what do you do yeah and i think the the precedent had been set right i always go back to that tokyo firebombing situation where it's like this is like other than the fact that it is a new technology you know they didn't quite know what the long-term effects would be of you know radiation sickness and stuff which was is just absolutely awful and it will change the world forever and it really did you know that the but if we look at just like a pure like death and destruction perspective like it's terrible as it is to say like dropping an atomic bomb is almost more humane than napalming, you know, a city like instant death vaporization under you know million degree heat versus potentially slowly burning as napalm kind of rips through your skin. Like it's a just an yeah. awful, awful way both ways, but like there's some level of humility to it all, which is still crazy to say, cause you're still killing tens of thousands of people in a blink of an eye. Yep. But yeah, I think it, we could see that like they they were eventually going to give up but like what if that coup did was successful like we have to think about things like that like what if they took the emperor and said like look we're in charge now all six of us think we're gonna keep fighting this war you know maybe they could have convinced the emperor maybe suzuki was killed like you know i think getting the japanese to surrender you know to defeat i think was sure it was inevitable it would have happened but who knows what, what could have happened and i think it's one of those things like there was too many unknowns to to really screw around and and not just get yeah, this thing done for sure i think by like the estimates that we've seen if they were to have dropped the bomb the amount of casualties that would have totaled on both sides would have been like over half a million people yeah. if they would have just kept fighting that kind of um um on on those theaters of war without dropping the mm-hmm. bomb the casualty count would have been way higher on both sides definitely yeah i think the the estimate Which is I such a was... weird calculus right like it's just like, there's <laughs> i know the, right the, I think at the end of the day, like we're talking about this and in retrospect as like amateur historians, you know, mm-hmm. for the perspective of a podcast, 
like you know we're in no in no ways trying to like diminish the loss of life that happened but again from a historical perspective like it's interesting to note that it was either prolong the war lose more lives on both sides end the war quicker and just have this kind of massive destruction happen but Mm -hmm. ultimately in the long run save a lot of people on both sides of the theaters of war so it's like yeah it's just again like i don't i i i I don't think I'll ever be in a position to do that calculus and I don't envy mm-hmm. anyone who has ever had to do that calculus. Cause it's, it, there's no winning there. Right. Yeah. And, and, and the grand scheme of things. And you even look at like, you know, it may have saved the Japanese from themselves as well. Right. Like there's some estimates that invasions of Japan would have you know, the, the initial invasion, 2 million Japanese soldiers and civilians would have been killed like 2 million. Like it's an insane number to even think about. And you know, they would have done it if they would have sat there and said, yeah, that one decisive battle. Yeah, we might lose 2 million people, but we might win, right? <laughs> we and might so maybe win. We can get those better terms in that one last that one last battle is still always in the back of their head. So I, I think, Richie, this is a, maybe a good place to to pause and, and pick up next time um, where we can talk a bit more of, you know, we talked a little bit about with the speed of surrender. And there's a, there's a few other interesting points around you know Russia's involvement um, and what and what Stalin had planned and and some of the other options that they considered, but also like how does Truman's legacy kind of roll up into this um, and, and where do we kind of see him? Do we see him in a different light kind of after talking about this? So I'm excited to talk about that, but we'll we'll save that one um, for next week. So um, yeah, see everybody next week. Oh, thanks everyone. Thank you so much for listening to the History in Motion podcast. We appreciate your support. And if you're a fan of what you heard, please like, subscribe, and share. And we'll see you next time.